<clears throat> okay, good to have the opportunity once again to come out and invite you to get your Bibles and follow along as we open the Word of the Lord, and we'll trust that our time will be beneficial as we study the Scriptures again, another requested lesson as we're going to be talking about the Holy Spirit, and to, to dive into that just a little bit. Uh, actually, there's a whole series of lessons you can teach on this, but we're going to kind of give a brief overview first off of who the Holy Spirit is and basically uh, how He fits in the scheme of redemption. <clears throat> All right, so the first thing we want to talk about is that the Holy Spirit is a person. For instance, our Jehovah's Witnesses friends, they try to say that He's just a mere power of Jehovah. Uh, it's sort of like electricity. It's not really a person, not really a, a uh, a living, thinking being, but just sort of power, and that God uses him and uh, uses this power, not a him, but he, he is a person. That, that, that's how the Bible describes. Is he, is he only power? Is the Holy Spirit, does the Holy Spirit have power? Well, yeah, he has power, but he's not just mere power like electricity or something. For instance, in the book of Acts chapter 10, verse 38, it says, How God anointed Jesus and Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and with power. Now, if the Holy Spirit is simply power, we would actually read the verse, uh, How He anointed Jesus and Nazareth with holy power and with power. Now, that doesn't make sense. If, he, if, if He's a person, yeah, you understand the Holy Spirit and with power. And so that He is a powerful being. Uh, there in the book of uh, Romans chapter 15, notice there in verse 13, Now the God of hope fill all of you with joy and peace, believing that you may abound in hope through the power of the Holy Spirit. Did he say through the power of the holy power? Well, no, that's not what he said. That, that doesn't really make sense. Drop down verse 19. Through mighty signs and wonders by the power of the Spirit. By the power of the power? I mean, if you think the Holy Spirit is just mere power, that's the way you would have to read it. But that doesn't make sense. He, he is a person. He's a being. And uh, he's referred to as he, not referred to as it. You, you don't talk about electricity. You know, the electricity, you know, you don't say he, he could kill you. You say it, it might kill you because it's not a person. Electricity is not a person. For instance, in the book of uh, 1 Corinthians there, oh, uh, well, I didn't read that, but uh, that says the same thing, that uh, spirit. Uh, but let's look there in John chapter uh, 14, verse 26. But the Comforter, who is the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he, he didn't say it. No, it says, he shall teach you all things and bring all things to your remembrance, whatsoever I said unto you. And then you look into chapter 16, uh, there in verse 8. Uh, it says, and when he is come, he who? He, the Holy Spirit. He, referring to a person, a being. He will convict the world of sin, of righteousness, and of judgment to come. And drop on down in verse 13. It says, when he, he who? The spirit of truth. Not it, but he. But when he, the spirit of truth, has come, he will guide you into all truth. For he, that is the Holy Spirit, shall not speak of himself. Himself, not itself, but himself. Again, talking about as if it's a person, because the Holy Spirit is a person. And whatsoever he shall hear, that shall he speak, and he will show you things that come. So the Holy Spirit can hear, and he speaks, uh, etc. And he's referred to as he. And that's how the Bible uses that. Verse 14, And he shall glorify me, for he shall, not, for he shall receive of mine, and shall show it unto you. So uh, the Bible is pretty clear that the Holy Spirit that, of course, he is powerful, but he's a he, he's a person. And he's not just some sort of thing like electricity or like dynamite or like nuclear energy. No, uh, look at some of the language when uh, used in reference to the Holy Spirit. For instance, in Acts chapter 13, talking about those that were there in Antioch. It says in verse 2, And they ministered to the Lord and fasted, and the Holy Spirit said, I mean, you don't say, well, you know, electricity is saying, electricity talking, no. Uh, but uh, you talk about the Holy Spirit. Yeah, he speaks. Separate me, Barnabas and Saul, for the work which I have called them. That's the language of a person talking. And then notice there in the book of uh, chapter 16, Acts chapter 16, it says, Now when they had gone through uh, Phygeria and unto the region of uh, Galatia, uh, they were forbidden of the Holy Spirit to preach the word in Asia. 
after that they come to Messiah, uh, Messiah uh, they had attempted to go into Bithynia, but the Spirit prevented them not. So the Spirit's like, ah, hold on, no, no, don't, don't go there. Again, it, it's a person, a being that is uh, talking about. In Acts chapter 21 and verse 11, and when he was come unto us, he took Paul's uh, belt and bound his uh, own hand and feet, as Agabus speaking, Thus says the Holy Spirit. Sounds a whole lot like the Old Testament. Thus saith the Lord. But here it says, Thus saith the Holy Spirit. And so shall be, uh, so shall the Jews at Jerusalem bind the man that owns this belt, etc. So, thus saith the Holy Spirit. Like, thus saith the Lord. I mean, you, when you say, Thus saith the Lord, are we talking about the Lord's not some sort of being, some sort of person? No, we say, Thus saith the Lord, because the Lord speaks and reveals to us. And then, of course, there in 1 Timothy chapter 4 and verse 1, now the Spirit speaks expressly. The, the Spirit speaks clearly. As, you know, sometimes uh, we can speak, and we don't speak clearly, but not the Holy Spirit. When He speaks, He speaks expressly. He speaks very distinctly, very clearly. And uh, God says what He uh, means, and He means what He says. He doesn't just kind of just talking just for the sake of talking. So the first thing, when we talk about the Holy Spirit, He is a person. He is a, a person, a being, and that he is deity. Not only is he a person, but he is deity, in fact. In the book of Acts chapter 5, in Acts chapter 5, when Peter confronts Ananias and Sapphira, and Peter said, Ananias, why has Satan filled your heart to lie to the Holy Spirit? So when they asked about selling this property, and, and uh, we gave it all, Right, so let's say they, they sold the property for 10000 Yeah, we, we gave 10000 as if they gave it all, which really they didn't. Maybe they did sell it for ten. Maybe they sold it for 20000 but they pretended like they gave it all what they didn't, and so they were lying about it. It wasn't the fact that they didn't, uh, you know, they kept back part of it. That wasn't the problem. The problem was they lied about the matter. But Peter said, Ananias, why has Satan filled your heart to lie to the Holy Spirit to keep... <coughs> Excuse me to keep back part of the price of the land. While it remained, was it not your own? And after it was sold, was it not in your own power? Well, yeah, 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 it was yours. It was yours when you owned it. When you had the money in your hand, it was yours. And if they wanted to keep part of it, that was okay. But to lie about it, that was the problem. Why have you conceived this thing in your heart? You have not lied unto men, but you've lied to God. So when they lied to the Holy Spirit, Peter says you've lied to God. Because the Holy Spirit part of the eternal Godhead. He is deity. There in Isaiah chapter 6, it was prophesied. Uh, it says, And I heard the voice of the Lord. I heard the voice of Jehovah. If you notice, uh, it speaks there. Saying, Whom shall I send and who will go for us? That is plural. That is the Jehovah, the, actually the Godhead. Then said I, Here am I, send me. And he said, Go. Jehovah saying, Go. And tell this people, so Jehovah says, go. But then you notice in the book of Acts chapter 28, Paul quotes from Isaiah and the words of Jehovah. And it says, and when they agreed not among themselves, they departed after Paul had spoken one word. Well spoke the Holy Spirit by Isaiah the prophet unto the fathers. Go unto the people and say, etc., etc." So Jehovah speaks about, you know, go speak to this people. And then Paul says, well, that's the Holy Spirit talking. And he was talking through the prophet Isaiah because the Holy Spirit is actually part of the Godhead. And when we look at the Holy Spirit, he, you know, omni. Omni is the Greek word for all. When you talk about omnipresent, that is all present. You talk about omnipotent, all powerful. You talk about omniscient, all knowing. Well, the Holy Spirit has those characteristics. Let's talk about that. In Psalm 139, verse 7, uh, where shall I go from your spirit? I mean, can we go down in the deep, dark recesses of Mammoth Cave and hide from the spirit? No. Can we go way out in the middle of the Pacific, away from all the continents, just way out there by yourself and escape the Holy Spirit? No. Can we go really, really high up in a, a you know, a, the space shuttle or whatever, one of the spaceships, SpaceX? You get away from the presence of the Holy Spirit? No. Where shall I go from your spirit or where shall I flee from your presence? You can't. You can't because the Holy Spirit is omnipresent. Because he, he's deity. 
Notice there in the book of Romans chapter 15, Romans chapter 15. <clears throat> in Romans chapter 15, notice there in number 19, Romans chapter 15 and number 19. It says, through mighty signs and wonders by the power of the Holy Spirit. Well, who can do mighty signs and wonders? Well, it's by the power of the Holy Spirit. Who can do the Only God. When the apostles did them, it's because God empowered them to do that. And so Paul talks about the Holy Spirit able to do signs and wonders. Omni, uh, omni, that is all power, omnipotent is the pronunciation when you put the two words together. And then notice over there in the book of uh, 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 1 Corinthians chapter 2, and really this is uh, pretty, pretty impressive when I think about the, these verses here. It's, it's who else but God when you talk about the Holy Spirit, it has to be God. It says in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, notes number 10 and 11, but God has revealed them unto us by His Spirit. That is, these things that are being revealed in the gospel message. They've been revealed unto, uh, unto us by His Spirit. For the Spirit searches all things, yea, the deep things of God. I mean, you think about how smart God is, that He created DNA. He created human beings. He created the human body. I mean, look at all these doctors. I mean, they study for years just to be a general doctor. And then if you get into specialty, you study even more years. And maybe they just focus on an eye. And here's a doctor, he focuses about mouth and ears. Another doctor, he's, he studies about the heart. And he studies years and practices about that. And you have those with the circulation system. I mean, the complexity of the human body. I mean, just sit down and try to explain that. I mean, you got, you got volumes of book to try to explain of how all this works. And who did that? Well, God created man. And so God has to be pretty smart. I mean, you just look at the world and how everything fits together. It's, it's, it's just incredible. It says, For the Spirit searches all things, even <clears throat> yea, uh, the deep things of God. Who but God could it, to search the deep things of God? You, you'd have to have deity. For what man knows the things of a man except the spirit of man which is in him? Even so the things of God knoweth no man but the spirit of God. So you, had, you would have to have deity, the Holy Spirit would have to be deity to search the deep things of God the Father. And so he is deity. He's a person. The Holy Spirit is a person. He is a being. He is deity. And he's part of one of the persons of the triune Godhead. And... Uh, the Bible uses that phrase, of course, in Acts chapter 17. In Acts chapter 17, where it talks about that you ought not to think that the Godhead is made unto like gold and silver. Or Paul talks about the Godhead there in Romans chapter 1. And uh, Acts chapter, or Colossians chapter 2, that uh, Jesus is the fullness of the Godhead bodily there in Colossians 2 and verse 9. But look there in the book of Luke. Now, sometimes people get tripped up. <clears throat> about uh, the Godhead, and how could you have three in one? I mean, it's like God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. How, how can they be one? It's like one plus one plus one equals one, and they'll just laugh and make fun of that, like somehow that just sounds so stupid. <clears throat> it's like you can talk about an apple. You got an apple, an apple, okay, you got a peel, you got the meat, and you got the core. You got three distinct parts so we got one part, that is, we've got the peel, and we got the meat, the white part that you sort of eat, and then you got the core that you wind up throwing away. So we pick up, do we say, hey, I've got in my hand three apples? No, we say an apple, one apple, singular. One, I have one apple here in my hand. Three distinct parts, but three, but still just an apple, one, one apple. Or you could say the same thing about an egg. You got the shell, you got the white, you got the yellow, three distinct parts, but still it's just an egg, one egg. And so we have the one Godhead, but there are three persons. And people think, that, well, we just sort of made that up. It's not. You just see that, and, and there's several verses that talk about how each, each one is mentioned individually, sometimes even in the same verse. For instance, there in Luke chapter 1, <clears throat> In verse 35, And the angel answered and said uh, unto her, The Holy Spirit shall come upon you, and the power of the highest. So you got the Holy Spirit coming upon, the power of the highest, that is, would be the Father, 
shall overshadow you. Therefore also the holy thing which shall be born of you shall be called the Son of God. So you got the Holy Spirit, you got the highest, that will be the Father, and the Son of God, that's Jesus. Three distinct persons. Notice there in the book of uh, John chapter 14. John chapter 14. Notice there number 15 and 16, <clears throat> or 16 and 17. Jesus, I, so, so we have Jesus, he says, I will pray the Father. So you got Jesus, he's praying to the Father, and he shall give you another comforter that he may abide with you. And who is the comforter? Verse 17, even the spirit of truth. So we've got Jesus, we've got the Father, we've got the comforter, that is the spirit of truth, the Holy Spirit. Three, again, three distinct persons in the one Godhead. And of course, in the Great Commission, Baptizing them as you go make disciples, baptizing in the name of the Father, name of the Son, name of the Holy Spirit. Again, three persons in the one Godhead. I like this passage over in 2 Corinthians uh, chapter uh, 12 there, and uh, oh, chapter 13, excuse me. In chapter 13, number 14, it says, The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the one person of the Godhead, and the love of God, that's the Father, that's the second person, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Three distinct persons <coughs> mentioned. Three distinct persons mentioned. Again, just one of many verses that uses this whole idea of the three persons in the one Godhead. And then let's look uh, one more. Over there in the book of Revelation, chapter 1, Revelation chapter 1. In number four and five, it says, John to the seven churches of uh, seven churches of Asia, seven churches which are in Asia, grace be unto you and peace from him who is and who was and who is to come. That would be the Father. And from the seven spirits, seven being the perfect number, the complete number, the seven spirits, that is talking about the Holy Spirit who is before the throne, and from Jesus Christ who is the faithful witness. So you got the Father, you got the Son, you got the Holy Spirit. And there are other passages that you could cite that talk about the three distinct persons of the one Godhead. So, who is the Holy Spirit? Well, he's a person. He's not, he's not just some abstract power like electricity or, or like light energy or some sort of form of energy. No, he's a person. He's powerful. He's deity. He's divine. He's part of the eternal Godhead, one of the persons of the triune Godhead. And then let's talk about his work in creation. All right. We're going to see the Holy Spirit in His work in physical creation. And it's similar to the work in spiritual creation. All right, so let's talk about uh, the physical creation. All right, in Revelation chapter 4, Revelation chapter 4 and verse 11, who planned creation? Well, I would say God the Father. It says there in Revelation 4 and verse, uh, Revelation chapter 4 and verse 11, Contextually talking about the one that's upon the throne, speaking of, in particular of God the Father. You're worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power, for you have created all things, and for your pleasure they are and were created. It was in the mind of the Father that he planned, that he was the one that created the world, uh, had this plan in his mind, and the agent was Jesus who would carry that plan out. Notice there in the book of Ephesians chapter 3, down there in verse 9. And to make all men see what is the plan uh, of the mystery, which from the beginning of the ages has been hid in God, who created all things by Jesus Christ. And you can see there in John chapter 1, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was God, and the Word was God. All things were made by Him, and not anything was made that was made. So Jesus was the agent. God had this in His mind. Jesus was the agent who carried out the physical creation. That He made the planets, and He made the, <coughs> excuse me, the, the solar system, He made the sun, the moon, the trees, the birds, the animals, uh, human beings, etc. He, he's the one who made all these things. And then we see... Uh, like we go back to Genesis chapter 1. In the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. Verse 2 it says, And the earth was without form and void, and darkness was upon the face of the earth, uh, upon the deep, face of the deep, and the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. So it appears that God just sort of basically made the elements first, and then it speaks about the Holy Spirit. And what's something interesting as Jesus is making these things, that the Holy Spirit was somehow involved in the organizing of these things. Notice over there in the book of uh, Psalm, 
in the, in the book of Psalms, the 104th Psalm, uh, Psalm 104, and that was in verse 30. Verse 30, yeah, verse 30. <clears throat> you send forth your spirit, they are created, and you renew the face of the earth. So it seems uh, to me by looking at these verses that God had the plan. Jesus came and began to do uh, the work of creating the actual elements, etc., and that the Holy Spirit was involved in kind of the organization, renewing. It talks about the face of the earth there. And then it seems to be somewhat parallel in the spiritual realm. Again, you have God the Father sort of planning these things. If we go back to the book of Ephesians, in Ephesians chapter 3, notice there in Ephesians chapter 3, <clears throat> Paul talking, of course, about spiritual things in uh, uh uh, context that is the, the mystery in Christ Jesus of redemption, spiritual creation, and to make all men see what is the plan uh, of the mystery which from the beginning of the ages has been hid in God. So God, when he creates the physical world, he creates human beings and physical, uh, the physical world and human beings with the power of choice. And if people have the power of choice, which means they could do good, what if you have the power of choice? They, they could do bad. So what would God do? I mean, if people have the choice to do good, I'm sure he had a plan. It didn't turn down to, that way. But if man choose to do bad, what would God do? Would God do anything? Would just bring judgment upon us or what? Well, no, he had a plan. That is the spiritual creation in Christ Jesus, the mystery. That Jew and Gentile all would be reconciled in the one body in Christ. Of the great plan of God that Jesus would die for all. That his blood would reach back through the, uh, the Old Testament ages and then reach forward to the end of time uh, to the ultimate consummation of all things. And so what do we see? All right, so God has his plan and then Jesus comes and executes that, executes that plan in coming to live upon earth. Being born of, of the Virgin Mary, growing up, living among men, teaching, etc., being betrayed, and then ultimately dying on the cross, being buried. And so there in the book of Ephesians chapter 3 and verse 11, according to the eternal purpose which he purposed in Christ Jesus our Lord. So in God's spiritual creation of redemption in Christ Jesus, so God has this in his mind, and Jesus comes and he dies on the cross. He comes and incarnate in a physical body, lives among men, preaches and does all the things that he does while here upon there, ultimately to be betrayed and then to die a very cruel, agonizing death, which fulfills all these foreshadows of the suffering servant of Jehovah, which would then satisfy the justice of God, but then able to manifest mercy toward humanity, therefore could offer forgiveness. Yeah, he's the one that came and work the plan being here upon planet earth and of course Jesus died he was buried but then he was raised from the dead and that, that's another interesting thing again because you see all three persons of the one Godhead because you know Jesus said in John 10 he says I have the power to lay it down I have the power to take it again and then you read verses where the Holy Spirit was involved in his resurrection. And then you read verses about how God the Father was involved in his resurrection. Now, how does that all work? I don't know. I'm just, I'm just, that's just the way it describes it. And, you know, some things, it's like Jesus coming to a tabernacle. Well, so exactly how did he do that? Well, I, I don't know exactly how all that works. I just know the fact of it, that he came and was born of the Virgin Mary. And, and that part of the eternal God came and dwelt in a tabernacle of flesh. That's just, I don't know how to explain it, but I, I just know the fact of it. All the details, sometimes I don't know all the details. So God has this, physical, this spiritual creation that he has in his mind. Jesus comes and, uh, you know, he brings it all to pass by coming to this world. You know, all the things line up in genealogy to be born of the Virgin Mary, to be born of the house of David, to be born of, of the seed of Abraham, to be born of a virgin. I mean, he, he gets all these things planned out uh, to where it's all fulfilled in Mary. And then Jesus is raised from the dead. He sends back on high. And then the Holy Spirit comes back. And then he was involved in particular in the work of revelation and confirmation, making known and working uh, through the apostles and working among men even yet today that he works among 
people, not in a miraculous way, but in his providential way through his word. Uh, when Paul talks about that earlier in chapter 3, uh, let me just back up to verse 3. Paul says, How that by revelation he may note unto me the mystery, as I wrote a foreign few word, uh, by which when you read you may understand my knowledge of the mystery of Christ, which in other ages was not made known to the sons of men, as it is now revealed unto his holy apostles and prophets. By who? By the Spirit. The Holy Spirit. So the Holy Spirit comes upon the apostles and prophets and enlightens and reveals these things. And then they would write these passages. Well, at first they were just merely preaching them. by They were preaching by inspiration, speaking the mind of God, revealing and explaining how all these things were of all these foreshadows and prophecies and how it's all fulfilled in Christ Jesus, giving all this explanation of the work that God, uh, of the plan that God had in his mind, that Jesus came and died on the cross and how all this fits together and explains how it all works in the New Testament order. That was the Holy Spirit's job, sort of organizing what's happening. And his job was revelation, making it known, and confirmation. Because the power of the Holy Spirit was upon the apostles and prophets, because here they are preaching. Okay, so they're preaching the Word. Well, how do we know that they're preaching the Word of God? How, how, how do we, just how do we know that this is, this is from God? Well, here's how you know they work miracles and say, you know, they would raise people from the dead. They'd speak in languages they'd never studied. They would interpret languages. They would heal the sick. I mean, here's somebody they couldn't hear, and now they're hearing. Here's somebody that couldn't walk, and now they're walking. And these miraculous powers from the Holy Spirit, part of the eternal Godhead, empower them to do these things to say, put the stamp of approval, say, yeah, these men are speaking for God. And then they would write these things. And like we studied there in John chapter 14, it was like, now did the apostles had to think back what, you know, Jesus taught at the Sermon on the Mount, or Jesus taught there in Galilee, or Jesus taught there in Jerusalem, or Jesus taught in whatever place? Did they, oh man, what, oh, what did Jesus say? I, oh, they didn't have to sweat that. The Holy Spirit would bring it all to remembrance. Part of the eternal Godhead would come upon them and guide them in giving this revelation, making known the mind of God. They wouldn't have to rely upon their human memory. See, the power of the Holy Spirit working in the big plan of God, first off in the physical creation, second off in the spiritual creation in Christ Jesus. And so the Holy Spirit, yeah, does He work today? Yeah, He works. Does He work directly? No, He works indirectly. We wield the sword of the Spirit. You know, God works in people. The Bible says God works in people. But how does it work with us and through us? It's through the Word of God. The Spirit-inspired Word. That when these teachings are given, that when it's planted in the hearts of people, it springs to life of good and honest hearts. It's sort of like seeds. You know, here you've got a handful of seeds. Whatever seeds they might be. They might be bean seeds. They might be pepper seeds. They might be tomato seeds. And they just sat there. But you know, you put them in the soil, the, the warm sunshine, water, they swell up, and they magically come to life by the power of God because God put that power in that seed. And they spring up, and they sprout up, and they grow, and they grow, and they produce the peppers, or they produce the tomatoes, or whatever seeds that you planted in your garden. And so here, this word, which is the seed of the gospel, is planted in the hearts of people. You know, when, when you just have the word, you know, here's a Bible sitting on somebody's table. Yeah, it's, it's nice, but it's got to get in the heart. It's got to be planted in the heart. And so when the teaching of the word of God is planted in the heart, it, it has the opportunity to spring to life. That the Holy Spirit then can move within his providence to work in the hearts of men and women. And to uh, let these thoughts generate into the minds of people that it springs to life spiritually. That we become a part of God's plan, God's scheme of things. Like I said, there's a whole series of lessons that you could talk about the Holy Spirit. But in the fundamental big picture, that's what, he, he's a person. He, he's deity. He's part of the eternal Godhead. He was involved in both physical and spiritual creation. And... Uh, like I said, lots to be said. You can study about miracles, the age of miracles, the temporal nature of that, and how the Holy Spirit works. Uh, you can talk about various aspects of the Holy Spirit, the baptism of the Holy Spirit that's talked about in the Bible, another topic. Uh, but he's part of the eternal Godhead, 
and he wants to work in your heart and our hearts. And it all happens when we hear this good news that emanates from the scriptures. The plan of salvation has been revealed. That is, the Holy Spirit tells, thus saith the Holy Spirit. Like Paul quotes, thus saith the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit says, hey, you need to hear this good news about Jesus. You can't believe on whom you've not heard. So when we hear the message, and we understand it, and then we say, yeah, hey, this has got to be it. This, this all makes sense. You know, some things you, you just listen to and thought, I don't know. But then you begin to think about it and look at all the evidence. Yeah, that, that's, that's, it's got to be that. And so we believe that Jesus is the Son of God, that he was raised from the dead. Did he live? Yeah. Did he die? Yeah. Was he buried? Yeah. But he was raised from the dead. I mean, the, the evidence is overwhelming. And if we believe that message to obey his command to repent, that's turning from sin and turning to God. Be willing to confess our faith. Say, yeah, I believe Jesus Christ is the Son of God. To make that confession before men. And then to be baptized, yeah. Because the Holy Spirit teaches us that. Thus saith the Holy Spirit. These are the words of the Lord Jesus. This is the command of Jesus. And when we do that, we come up out of that watery grave, a new creature in Christ. The Holy Spirit will let that word generate in your heart if you will accept it and receive it with a, a good and honest heart and believe it, yeah. It will work in your heart. And then we're exhorted to grow and be faithful. Be faithful unto death. And I'll give you the crown of life, Revelation 2 and verse 10. And we do here, come back through the second law part. We're going to sing this song to your encouragement. There may be one here even this evening. And if you want to hark to the gentle voice of Jesus through the spirit-inspired message of the, of the word of God, if we can help you in any way, you come and let us know why together as we stand and as we sing. <clears throat>